Hi, all. Welcome back to the Touch MBA podcast. I am your host, Darren. This week, I brought on Professor Wan Wang Soon Wai, who is the Associate Dean of MBA Programs and the Director of MBA Programs at the Chinese University of Hong Kong Business School. Now, I have a special relationship with this university. I actually studied abroad there when I was a junior in college, so I have very fond memories of the university in Hong Kong. But I really enjoyed this conversation because Professor Wan really puts the program in, in context. And I really appreciate his sort of clarity with what the program is about, what type of applicants they're looking for, and what they're ultimately trying to accomplish with the CUHK MBA program and how they're trying to help applicants like yourself who are interested in the program. So I think those of you interested in getting an MBA in Asia, getting an MBA in Hong Kong will find this conversation very valuable uh, for your research. And yeah, I hope you enjoy the episode. Remember that at Touch MBA, we offer free school selection help. That's the dent we're trying to make in the MBA universe. So if you're not sure which schools might fit you best, where you're competitive at, please feel free to come to touchmba.com, upload your profile and your goals, and we'd be happy to help you out there. So you can find all of that, again, for free at touchmba.com. And now let's get straight to my conversation with Professor Wan. Here we go. I'm really excited and honored, truly, to have our next guest on the show he is the Associate Dean of MBA Programs and the Director of MBA Programs at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, or CUHK Business School, where he has been for, I believe, over seven years. His research interests include financial reporting quality, corporate governance, entrepreneurship, and private equity. Before coming to CUHK Business School, he taught and researched at INSEAD and Northwestern Kellogg. Uh, he has an illustrious... Uh, <laughs> educational background. He earned his undergraduate degree in mathematics at Imperial College and later received his Doctor of Business Administration degree from Harvard Business School. And prior to obtaining his doctoral degree, he worked at KPMG in London, PricewaterhouseCoopers in Hong Kong, and also as an equity analyst with ABN Amro Bank in Hong Kong, covering software and IT. So he has uh, a very interesting uh, combination of academic and, and professional experiences as well as administrative experiences now at CUHK to share uh, with you guys. So I'm really excited to have him on the show. Professor Wan Wang Soon Wai, welcome to the Touch MBA podcast. Well, thank you, Darren. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> so I'm going to call uh, him Professor Wan over the course of the show. So Professor Wan, could you please let our listeners know about your main responsibilities now at CUHK Business School before we jump into the program? Yes, of course. Um, as uh, you already summarized, uh, there are three main areas uh, in terms of my duties here. Uh, so I am the Associate Dean and Program Director for our Masters of Business Administration. Uh, that involves, as you can imagine, a lot of administrative duties. Uh, that's one uh, aspect of my work. Uh, but the other two are equally important to me, and these are the research and teaching aspects. Uh, in fact, I do also teach in our own MBA program. Which course? Yes. I, I teach one of the core courses. Uh, it's called Corporate Financial Reporting. I'm actually yes. uh, meeting my students this afternoon, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> uh, so there are three main parts of uh, a typical faculty member's uh, duties profile, research, teaching, and service. So that, that's basically in the high level what I'm uh, doing here. Wow. Well, thank you again for, for your time this morning. Let's just get right into it. And the first question I ask each business school I bring on the show is, well, what makes the CUHK MBA unique from the other top business schools in Hong Kong and in the world? Yeah, that's a great question. I've asked myself this same question many times as well. And to be honest, you know, when you start looking at all the top programs around the world, there are definitely a lot of similarities. Right. I think the, the, the part I can talk about the uniqueness, first of all, is in terms of the regional aspect. Uh, so this is not going to be necessarily unique to CUHK. 
but it's unique to MBA programs in this part of the world. And that's this, uh, you know, the, it's the knowledge. It's the knowledge about local business. Uh, we talk a lot about how business has become more and more globalized nowadays. But at the same time, we recognize the importance of regional you know, politics, business practices. There are all sorts of things that, that we constantly hear about. Uh, you know, geopolitics is not far from business. We have to be aware of what's happening. Right? So in Hong Kong, I would say one of the big advantages is we are right next to mainland China. Hong Kong is one of the big uh, cities in China. It's, 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 very, it's fairly unique uh, in the context of China to start with uh, because of the history and uh, you know, the linguistic inheritance from the, from the colonial days. So this places Hong Kong in a quite unique position to act as this, you know, we, we call it a cliche sometimes, but it's really true, bridging East and West. And from a student or prospective student perspective, the key advantage is if you want to learn about China business, you want to know about how to do business with China or how to do business in China or anything to do relating to China. But going into China directly is a bit daunting. Hong Kong is a great middle ground, right? Because it is part of China, but at the same time, there's a lot of Western influence, which makes the transition a lot easier for an international applicant. So that's one unique part, I would say, in terms of the Hong Kong sort of you know, location. Now, as far as CUHK itself, within you know, the multiple you know, high caliber uh, educational establishments that are present in Hong Kong, one of the key unique features, I would say, is uh, our experience. Uh, just so your listeners uh, are aware, uh, we are celebrating this year the 60th anniversary of the founding of CUHK as a university, but also the start of CUHK Business School as a business school. So we have an equally long history. Now, 60 years to some people sounds old, to some people it does not sound old, right? But in the context of MBA programs in Hong Kong, I can say uh, CUHK MBA is the oldest. It was the very first MBA to be offered, not just in Hong Kong, but in this part of the world generally speaking, in the region. So that gives us a unique advantage in terms of the, um, the people we have had the opportunity to work with over the past several decades. So nowadays, you look around the region at all the prominent business people. If they have an MBA, chances are their MBA will be from CUHK. Right? It's just a, you know, a feature of history. I mean, you know, I can't claim credit for it, but it's a unique feature that we have. Yes. Yeah, I mean, actually, I think I think that's a a great question, or not a great question, but an interest I have that maybe you can also explain to our audience. You talk about this unique regional knowledge, and I know you guys talk about the Greater Bay Area or the Pearl River Delta, and I'm wondering if you can kind of explain to listeners who might not be familiar with the region what exactly that entails and how intertwined the business school is with this region? Sure. Let me take a step back and remind your listeners of uh, the way we phrase our vision as a business school here in CUHK. Our vision is very simply stated. It is to develop global business leaders for the Asian century, right? So the unique part about our part of the world is we focus on developing global business leaders for the Asian century. It's different from trying to develop global business leaders, full stop, right? We want to develop global business leaders for the Asian century. Now, when thinking about what this means, this Asian century, it is somewhat related to what you asked about the Greater Bay Area, all these recent developments uh, in the region. But if we take a step back and think in, back in history, China has always been a, a, a market that interests businesses. It goes back centuries. It's not a new phenomenon, right? But the difference nowadays is that it's actually happening that China is realizing its potential as this huge market with a lot of consumers with high disposable income. It's about to overtake the U.S. as the biggest economy on Earth. Now, the U.S. has been the dominant economy for decades. It's been a long time, which is why, you know, this idea of the Asian century is one that reflects this change in the world order. 
So, um, you know, thinking about how, how we in Hong Kong experience it and what it might mean to someone who's interested in coming and doing an MBA with us, you know, it's, uh, it's first of all, realizing the world is changing. I mean, we hear about it on the news all the time, all the geopolitical issues involving US and China on the one hand, and occasionally you throw in India, Taiwan, you know, many other parties, many other countries who have, who, who you know, who are part of this. And uh, so we realize, you know, uh, the, the, the skills that uh, business schools have been imparting to our students over the last several decades, we need to adapt as well. We need to adapt as well because the world is changing and we want to prepare our students to become global business leaders for tomorrow, not necessarily for today, right? So Hong Kong is very well placed because uh, it is a key, um, you know, a, a key player in this whole you know, global development that's taking place, in particular when it comes to China's plans, China as a country, as an economy. Hong Kong plays a key role. So, uh, so what some people may not be aware of is this concept of the Great Bay Area. It's a concept that uh, came about you know, a few years ago now. It's been around for quite some time. And it's this idea that uh, you know, we have uh, many Bay Areas around the world that have grown into economic powerhouses. You know, San Francisco Bay Area is a famous one. You, have, you also have Tokyo Bay. You have multiple Bay Areas around the world. And uh, the Greater Bay Area where Hong Kong is around us is another such manifestation of the confluence of many key factors in promoting economic development that uh, scholars have uh, you know, studied in other Bay Areas around the world. So now there are a few key differences. The Greater Bay Area of which Hong Kong is part is massive, it's much bigger than many of the other very well established Bay Areas around the world. It's part also of uh, a planned approach, which is quite different, I think, from what we've seen in, in, in Western regions, generally speaking, where it's more of an evolution over time. But what I have come to realize is that uh, in, in this part of the world, in, in China, there's a lot of planning going on. So this greater Bay Area is part of the long-term plan. And uh, there are several, you know, things that are being worked towards, and many of them we are already achieving. So, for instance, one of the ideas is within the Greater Bay Area, people mobility will be easy. So, you know, in theory, uh, from any point of the Greater Bay Area to another point in the GBA, maximum it will take is two hours of travel. That's what, uh, you know, the plan calls for. I think we're already pretty much there as far as Hong Kong is concerned. Uh, we have high-speed rail links. You know, COVID put a brief stop to it, but since uh, the high-speed rail lines have opened, the traffic has been, you know, has gone back to a lot of, you know, uh, previous levels. So what we are talking about in terms of the Asian century and how a concept like Great Bay Area plays a role in that, we are not just talking about a dream anymore. It may have been a dream decades ago, but I think we are now in the middle of living it, becoming a reality. You know, and that's the ex exciting part about being in this part of the world. We can just see things happen around us and be part of it and feel that, you know, we are living this part of history, which one day we look back, we will, we will feel an immense sense of uh, pride and satisfaction. So I hope this kind of, you know, covers a little bit about, you know, what you, you, you wanted me to uh, explain about this idea of the Greater Bay Area. No, it's, it's super helpful. And uh, I, I actually studied abroad as an undergraduate at CUHK in, I'm going to age myself now, but in 2000, 2001. And that was only a few years after the handover, right? From Hong Kong back to China. And I remember going to Shenzhen and it was... Emerging, let's put it that way. It was, it was, and now it's just an incredible city right across the border from Hong Kong now. And, and so it's been amazing to see over the past two decades. But if we could talk about academically, where do you think CUHK Business School really stands out? Yeah, great question. So uh, CUHK is one of the major comprehensive research universities in Hong Kong. Right. There, are, there are a number of, uh, of, of very high-level prestigious universities in Hong Kong. 
which is quite astounding when you think about it, given the size of the territory. If you're one city, you have multiple, a large number of uh, universities. As far as the academic uh, credentials of CUHP are concerned, I don't think it's uh, difficult for me to make the claim <laughs> that uh, we are right there. Right, you look at the several past years of globally recognized ranking. The CUHK as a comprehensive research university is consistently in the top 50. Now, uh, top 50, the other day I was talking to some of our students and I was trying to establish what does it mean to be in the top 50? Because, you know, if you have 50 universities in the world and you're in the top 50, that doesn't say much, right? <laughs> because by definition, you would have to be in the top 50. So I asked the question, like, how many universities are there globally? And it's very hard to come up with a precise number because no one keeps track of these things. But the best guess I could get was it's in the tens of thousands. We are talking about probably between 15 and 20,000 uh, globally. So being in the top 50 is not a small deal. It's a big deal. And uh, CUHK has been there all along. Uh, not to mention, you know, other tangible signals of that, you know, the presence of Nobel laureates, you know, among our faculty, you know, recipients of the Turing Award, of, you know, the Fields Medal in mathematics, you name it, whatever the academic uh, accolades are, chances are we have them. Somebody on our faculty has them, right? So I will stop here. Yeah. Do you think that the business school in particular is known for, for example, its finance department, or it's marketing or, or operations, or, you know, is it pretty even around all the disciplines? Um, yeah, I would say it's pretty even, but not because each discipline is average. It's pretty even because all disciplines are great. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, again, that's the difference, right? So, you, you know, I, I actually, uh, just for the record, to complete my, my profile, um, I teach a course called Corporate Financial Reporting, which is one of the requirements in our MBA program. The title disguises it a little bit, but it's actually an accounting course. It introduces our students to the fundamentals of the accounting system and how information gets reported among entities. Among our faculty here in the School of Accountancy, which is part of the business school, we have faculty members who have been uh, recognized for their research contributions in many different ways. And uh, for example, you know, some uh, uh, US based uh, uh, association who uh, give out uh, notable contributions awards for making advancements in the literature. The very first Hong Kong recipient of this kind of award was us in CUHK. And this is just one example that I'm familiar with because I happen to be in the School of Accountancy. But I'm pretty sure I ask around my other colleagues in other departments, they can tell us similar stories. Yes. <laughs> yes. So uh, I would say, you know, we, we are, the, the business school is one of eight faculties in, uh, in the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And uh, yes, we, we are you know, just as good as our, our, our fellow faculties, yes. if I may say it that way. No, thank you for sharing that. Like the, those details help. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, something that you've brought up a few times, and I just have to bring it up as well, because I hear from applicants, are the geopolitical issues that are that are happening. And so much has happened with Hong Kong and China in the past few years. And I'm wondering, like, do you believe that has affected, if at all, the MBA experience or what MBA students should expect, right, when they're coming to such a good school like CUHK? So there are many ways in which I think it, it has affected uh, the running of a program like ours. I don't have statistics to back up in detail what I conjecture to be the case, but I think there is a gradual shift in preferences in terms of prospective MBA students. So if, if I think back a few decades ago, the US, uh, I would say with a fair degree of certainty would be, you know, the, the first choice of most prospects and, uh, you know, for good reasons. I think nowadays it's not necessarily a given that the U.S. will be the top choice of MBA prospects. I think, you know, nowadays people are more aware of the different uh, geopolitical considerations, but also the fact that the world is actually changing and uh, schools like ours, we are position in you know, the best possible way, I think, 
to address this emergence of this idea of the Asian century. And uh, as I said, you know, it's not a dream because we all can sense it, we can feel it. You, you, you mentioned it yourself, you know, from the time you did your exchange here about 20 years ago now, if you don't mind me reminding people. <laughs> yeah, thanks for bringing <laughs> that up again. <laughs> and uh, like 20 years later, I mean, the, the change is enormous. It's, uh, it's, and you can see it with your own eyes. You don't have to rely on someone telling you this is what happened. You can actually see it yourself. Uh, so I think all of that is, it, it, it has met changes in terms of the, um, the, the prospects that are considering doing an MBA in an institution like ours. Now, I can, I can talk a little bit about uh, other ways in which it has affected us because it also changes the way we think about what we deliver as a program, of course, right? So uh, one aspect I didn't bring up earlier, this idea of an Asian century and us developing global business leaders for this Asian century. We don't call it the Chinese century. It's not just about China. It's a story about the emergence of Asia. And um, if you look at many of the projections, uh, very soon we are talking within our lifetime, right? You and I, <laughs> within our lifetime, the, the, among the top five or top 10 largest economies in the world, the majority will be from Asia. It's going to happen very soon. And uh, China is about to overtake the US. We don't talk much about India, for example. India is not even in the top five right now, but within the next uh, maybe 15, 20 years, ma you know, major projections are pointing to India becoming the third largest after China and the US. So for us, we also have to change and adapt what we deliver as a business education in preparation for the, the, you know, developing our students into becoming global business leaders. And that means we need to, to, to see this expertise. So, so right now, I would say being right next to China and, uh, you know, being part of China gives us a huge advantage in terms of understanding China. And what we are you know, envisioning as a next step is for us to become, you know, more of a global knowledge uh, repository. We get to know not just about China, but even you know Vietnam, where you are right now, is also a fast-growing economy. We want to be able to, you know, to deliver knowledge about Vietnam to students who come and study with us. India, I already mentioned, Indonesia is also another story that we don't hear about much, but it's going to be the fourth biggest economy within our lifetime: China, U.S., India, Indonesia. I mean, these are all reputable projections. I'm not making things up just myself. <laughs> yes. and, and so, you know, uh, this is kind of where we are working towards to, to you know, to uh, reinvent ourselves a little bit into, you know, changing from being a Hong Kong based to becoming a Greater Bay Area based and then ultimately later to be a region based and then a global uh, program. Got it. And yeah, I mean, I, I think... We covered a lot of that uh, about my next question, which is why Hong Kong for an MBA these days? But yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And because and, you know, you're know you in contact with students every year, right? Teaching that core course. Why do you think Hong Kong is an attractive destination for the top talent, top talent of MBAs? Yeah, I can actually talk about this in personal terms uh, because you, you, know, you look at me, you talk to me, you see me, you may not realize it, but I'm not from Hong Kong. Okay. <laughs> now, maybe a giveaway was my name, right? I'm actually from a small island nation called Mauritius. And Mauritius is part of Africa. Now, no, you might wonder why am I here in Hong Kong, right? I mean, it's the same idea <laughs> behind the question as to why an MBA student from outside of Hong Kong would want to come to Hong Kong. I think it's the same factors at play here. So um, I actually have a, a, a longer history in Hong Kong than my seven years with CUHK. Uh, before you did your exchange, I was actually in Hong Kong with uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, right? So, and then AD and Amaru. And I left uh, Hong Kong to pursue my doctorate and then work overseas. And I came back seven years ago. Now, you know, the, the, the reason I came back, I think, will apply to many others who are thinking about the same decision. Uh, it has to do with, with the future, right? So I've been in Hong Kong before. I came back seven years ago. I already noticed a huge amount of change. A lot of things have changed. Uh, you know, 
you know, depending on who you ask, it might be for the better, for the worse, but things change. I mean, that's the important thing, that things are not static. And uh, combined with this emergence of the Asian century, I think, you know, the, the big opportunities are going to be in this part of the world. Now, again, when you talk to me and you look at me, you may not realize it, but my Chinese skills are very mediocre. I will admit it freely. <laughs> I can get by, but, uh, you know, not, it's not to the level that I would like it to be. So, so for somebody who is a bit like me, who is a little bit apprehensive about the, the language barriers, the cultural shock, Hong Kong represents the best of both worlds. There is a very strong Western influence back from the days uh, under colonial rule. It's still present. And not knowing how to speak or read Chinese is not a disadvantage at all. But on this, at the same time, it gives us this immediate appreciation because we are right next door to Shenzhen. We are talking about you know, how Shenzhen has developed. So one of the uh, attractive aspects of our program, I would say, uh, for uh, our you know, overseas students is that we, we, like, we like our students to come to CUHK in Hong Kong and not feel that you're just in Hong Kong, but we are part of this greater Bay Area. So, for example, one of the things we do routinely, you know, and I, I encourage many of our teachers to, to think about this, is to organize field trips, take students to see with their own eyes, touch with their own hands, what we tell them about in the classroom, right? So yeah. to us, Shenzhen is not, is not, it does not involve a complicated schedule. No. <laughs> Just cross the border. Yes. <laughs> Just take yes. the train. Right. And in fact, uh, you know this already. CUHK were just five train stops from the border, less than 30 minutes. I think, I think officially it's 22 minutes, 22 minutes. <laughs> it's extremely convenient. So, you know, Hong Kong is not just Hong Kong. We are part of a bigger, uh, of a bigger picture in the region. And uh, we try to, you know, we, we structure the program to give all these opportunities to our students. So, you know, that would be one of the key attractions, I would say. Fantastic. Let's move on to talking about uh, your admissions sure. process. And so are there any certain values or traits you're looking for from applicants that are applying to your program? Yeah. So I wouldn't necessarily is a trait. But, you know, I explained to you our vision to develop global business leaders for the Asian century. So ideally, our students align with our vision, right? So if somebody is interested in becoming a global business leader, but they don't care about the Asian century, I would argue that may be a, 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 not as good a fit as somebody who shares the full vision of our business school. So it's not necessarily a trade, but it's more a question of attitude. And what is it that the applicant is looking for? And importantly, if they are looking for something, can we deliver it? Because if they are looking for something and we cannot deliver it, well, I don't think there's much point uh, us talking much further. Right? We yeah. have to recognize that part. So, so we, we, we understand our limitations as well. We are very strong in a lot of areas, but we, just like anybody in the world, we can't know everything. We can't be everything to everyone, right? So the key thing I think, you know, in terms of admissions is applicants who come and talk to us, we need to get a sense that we have a shared vision, that we have the same goals we are working towards. And then the secondary parts become, you know, the background, the skills, the trades, you know, these kinds of things. But the starting point is we need to have this shared vision. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense for us to be talking about partnering. Yes. Yeah, I mean, and so someone, you alluded to this earlier, but for someone, say, from Vietnam or from Germany or even from the U.S. who doesn't have, has the interest, right, who has a matching vision but might not have the background to match that, what would you say to them? I mean, by background, I mean maybe they haven't studied in 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 Asia before, or haven't worked in Asia before, but they have this uh, immense interest. They also kind of share the vision of what you've laid out of what's what's going to happen. Yeah. So so the way I think about it is actually very simple. I'm a simple person, right? So when we talk about the objective, the vision, 
This is something we can imagine in our mind. When we talk about background, this is what happened to us in the past. We are all at different points at this point in time, right? You are at a different point, I'm at a different point, our prospects are at different points, and that's all because of our backgrounds. We come from different backgrounds. But if we have this shared vision of where we are walking, working towards, we can individually plot our path to get there. Our paths are going to be different because we start from different points. So background to me is not as important, right? So the fact that let's say a US-based applicant is interested in becoming a global business leader for the Asian century, but they've never had any Asian experience, I would say that's not a problem at all. The important thing is that's what you want to be. In fact, the experience with us is going to be the experience that's missing from your background. <laughs> if you see what I mean, right? So, so the, the prior background itself is not, is not critical in that sense, uh, because you know, the, the experience with us is going to be part of that person's background after they are done with their MBA. So it's not so much the background, I would say, it would not, to me, it's not a, a barrier. And, you know, we can talk about other aspects later, GMAT scores, uh, yeah. you know, financial <laughs> aspects, <laughs> but the, the, the key starting point is this shared vision. Mm, got it. And and what personally makes you excited uh, when you see an application, when you see an essay or see a resume or meet someone for an interview? What gets you and your team excited? Yeah. And so I think that's a very easy one for me to answer because, you know, I've done many of these kinds of interviews. And uh, I would say the ones that uh, excite me the most are when applicants are willing to be authentic and describe them in their own ways. What I find not informative at all is when a, a prospect, uh, for example, does a ton of research on our program and many other programs, and then uh, writes an essay or you know, provides answers during the interview that sound like I'm saying something that I think you would like me to say. Right? I, I find that very non-informative because, because to me, a lot of the time, you know, I remind people if you tell me something that you read on our website, I already know it. You're not telling me something new. Right. All I'm learning from you is that you're good at memorizing things. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, 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 the applications that excite me the most are the ones where people are willing to explain and describe themselves and describe you know, why this uh, vision that CHK Business School has to transform them into global business leaders for the Asian century how they think it will happen after they join our program. That to me is, you know, what, what makes it very, very rewarding. You know, and each case is unique. Each person has a different starting point, as you said. And learning about how they are thinking about this, creating this path for themselves and how we can be part of that. I mean, that, that's, that's what I find very, very, very exciting. Hmm. Yeah. And, and so. Could you tell us a bit more about your process, your admissions process? It seems like it's a very quick turnaround, uh, but okay, let's, let's, let, me, let me make it a bit easier. So let's start with the hard things like, like test scores. Like uh, what are you looking for there? Are you looking for certain, for example, baseline percentage performance in the quant part of, of the GMAT? What are sort of your criteria with, with the standardized tests first? So with regards to standardized tests and many other sort of quantifiable aspects of somebody's background, my general uh, answer to your question will be, if we want to be flexible, we don't want these quantitative thresholds to determine whether you know, a prospect deserves or we deserve to educate this prospect. It's all about having this shared vision, being able to plot the path between where we stand today and that vision, and whether CUHK MBA can play a role in it. Now, if a person is very good at establishing their plan, and then in the process of discussing it, we realize, oh, you're asking for things that we cannot provide because we do not have that kind of resource, then it's not a good fit, right? It doesn't matter if you have you know, 800 GMAT, right? It doesn't matter if you're extremely rich and you can afford the tuition fee. It, all of these don't matter if we cannot have this alignment of objectives. And same token, somebody who is you know, very um, thoughtful about planning this path for themselves and has thought about how a program like ours can help them and can articulate it well, then GMAT 
financial uh, situation, all these become things we can overcome. So we don't see these as being barriers. They are more like you know, they are like more like gatekeeping things, right? It's, it's like to, to to provide a a, a, a minimum amount of uh, of uh, to, to prevent us being deluged with <laughs> with, uh, right. with too many applications. But other than that, I would say we we try to be flexible. Yes. And how would you advise an applicant who has been listening to us and is intrigued by what we're talking about, about this vision, to learn more about the school so that they can really or seriously consider it as an option? What do you think is the best way to do that? So the best way I would say, you know, start with a a sort of, you know, from a distance approach. Our website is quite comprehensive. We put a lot of information about our program on our website. This is a first starting point, but it's not going to be complete. There will always be things that are updated, things that you know you cannot quite get. You know, you know, and I will also admit it. Also, sometimes there are inconsistencies in different parts of the website. It happens for all of us, right? So the next step I would say is the best one, and that's to talk to us. Just talk to us. Make an appointment. There, there are no strings attached. Whenever you talk to us. It's more a matter of like we are doing now. We are having a conversation. We try to understand each other. And at the end of it, if our paths align, if our objectives align, great. We figure out the next step. If we have a conversation, we realize, oh, you know, we are talking different things. We part amicably. There's no hard feeling either way. (laughs) So, So I would say I would encourage anyone who is intrigued and interested in what we've been talking about, get in touch with us. And, um, the, the, you know, we, we are on standby all the time. Uh, we will find it a, a spot to, to slot you in to be able to have a proper conversation with you. Great. And yeah, I'll, I'll be sure to link to your site so listeners can do that immediately. Professor Wan, do you have any other application tips, uh, given your experience now, that could help applicants to, to your MBA program? Yeah, let me, let me try and think. So we didn't touch on the timeline. Right? So for us, we actually have five rounds of application in the coming year. Uh, the first one is the end of October. So we still have a month and a half before the first application round. Now, we work on a rolling basis for our admissions, which means that, uh, you know, I guess it's a good tip for people who are interested. It means that after each round, we are going to assess all the applications received during that round. And that all the applications that meet our requirements in terms of having these shared visions, you know, being able to plot the path properly, you know, understanding what role the CHKMB program can play, you know, subject to space being available, we will offer admission to those students, which means there is an advantage in, in, in being a little bit early in that sense. Uh, it's not necessarily a guarantee that if you are early, you're going to get in. <laughs> But uh, if you are late, there may be a chance the spots are all filled and then you will have to wait for next year, for example. Right. So that's one tip I will give to the prospective applicants. Yeah. And I would just love to also hear your thoughts on interviews Yeah, on, on those interviews. Like, um, do you guys do behavioral interviews? What are those MBA interviews like admissions interviews? For us, the process is actually very straightforward. Uh, you know, uh, you mentioned our process is relatively short. So, you know, after having gathered uh, all the information uh, necessary to decide whether or not to apply, right? That's the first step: decide on whether or not the you know the the prospective applicant is interested in applying. I would say, you know, uh, get in touch with our admissions team. It's not the formal interview stage yet. This is informal conversation to fill in the gaps in you know, understanding about what the program can and cannot do. The interview itself, you know, if uh, an applicant reaches that stage, the interview involves two, uh, a panel of two people. So we, um, in CUHK, we ask uh, our own teaching faculty members to take part in these interviews for several reasons. So for one, it gives the, the applicant a sense of who they will be taught by. Right, it's not just administrators, but also teaching faculty who take part in the interviews. And the the, the key point is, I think you know, be prepared, but don't be over prepared. <laughs> if that makes sense, right? So be prepared in the sense of knowing what you want out of the MBA program and knowing where you want to go after you do an MBA. 
But don't be prepared in the sense, uh, over prepared in the sense of spending, you know, on prep uh, resources, getting someone to help you revise your essay 10 times. I mean, this, these are nice, but it doesn't really, you know, I don't think in the end it affects the, the ultimate outcome. The, the key thing is be yourselves. You know, when you're in the interview for the formal interview, your job is to explain to the panel your vision of how this program can help you. Where are you today? Where you, do you want to be? And how can our program help you get there? If you can articulate this well and take a consideration of your own particular circumstances and illustrate, I think that's a very convincing uh, argument for, for someone who is a good fit with our program. So don't, don't worry too much about things like, you know, GMAT scores or uh, grades in the, you know, your previous degrees. You know, th these are important, yes, but they are not the, the main ones. Yes. Really appreciate you kind of taking a step back and sharing your the overall philosophy you and your team takes when evaluating the applications. I think it'll be very helpful to listeners. Maybe we can also have a similar discussion about scholarships and how mm -hmm. you view scholarships, what applicants mm -hmm. can do to improve their chances if they are able to get in, of course. Yeah. So uh, it's related to another topic, which is the living cost. Right, because Hong Kong, we know, is not a cheap city to live in. So uh, tuition fees for an MBA program are no exception. They are high. We understand that. We, you know, we do not hide from it. It's a reality. So we also understand that when prospects approach us from outside of Hong Kong, it can be a shock to realize that it involves the tuition, not just the tuition, but also the overall living expenses. So directly to your question, in terms of my attitude to scholarships. I view scholarships uh, you know, in a good way. I think scholarships, there are many types of scholarships that uh, we are lucky to have available here in CUHK MBA. For admissions purposes, we have a number of admission scholarships uh, which will be assessed. Luckily for prospects, they are assessed automatically. There's no special application separately required. So these uh, uh, are based on criteria such as, you know, the experience, the work experience, you know, the former academic achievements, the GMAT scores, you know, all of these go into a holistic assessment to help out in terms of the admission scholarship. We also have uh, you know, other, not necessarily related to admissions, but we have a number of other scholarships that are granted during the course of uh, the program studies. And these tend to be more, you know, it, it sort of reflects the wishes of the, of the scholarship uh, provider, if I can put it that way, right? So we are very lucky. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, to, to mention something I touched on earlier, we are very lucky. We, we are the oldest MBA program in Hong Kong. We have many alumni who are very dedicated to the program because they all understand how helpful it was for themselves to help them succeed in their careers. So we receive you know, requests from alumni to provide these kinds of scholarships, financial assistance to current students. And often it will be accompanied by specific requests. So for example, it could be a student who is interested in a specific industry because that's the donor's industry, right? Or it could be something that's related to somebody from a specific country, right? Again, because you know, that reflects the, the, the interest of the, of the donor. So we have these kinds of uh, assistance available as well. Not a large number, I would say, uh, but they are there. And uh, it's always helpful to be able to do that. Now, if I may, I will touch on something else, which is uh, di not directly related to your question, but is pertinent. And this is the living expenses. The cost of living in Hong Kong is very high. Now, uh, this is something that's going to be a very important distinguishing factor for CUHK. We have a very large campus. We are very lucky. We have the largest campus of all the universities in Hong Kong. I saw uh, a, a picture the other day, a colleague sh was showing us. If you add together the area, the land area of all the other universities in Hong Kong, it's smaller than CUHK's land area. We have the largest campus, right? And what that means is that we are also lucky that uh, we are able to offer campus housing to our MBA students. Now, this is quite unique uh, as far as I know. I wasn't too sure about it uh, until very recently. I was asking around 
But I think I can say with a fair degree of, of certainty, CUHK is the only MBA program in Hong Kong that will provide this opportunity to live on campus. And uh, the advantage is non-negligible. I don't know if you're familiar with the typical rent level in Hong Kong. And, you know, we, oh, are yeah. talking, <laughs> we are talking several thousand US dollar equivalent per month. Um, on campus, it probably will be less than 500 US dollars a month. So we are talking a huge advantage in terms of uh, this opportunity to live on campus. Not to mention the other social advantages, you know, in, uh, completing homework, you know, getting to know students from, from, from other parts of the world, other industries. And that's, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big deal. So I want to make sure that uh, our listeners uh, you know, realize that uh, CUHK MBA offers this unique advantage. You can live on campus during your MBA study. Yeah, and and I'll just share from my experience. It, it does feel very residential when you're there. It's uh, CUHK is based right off of a subway stop, a uh, KCR stop, I guess you could call it. But and then you're at the campus, and it's huge, and it feels very residential, like you're kind of away from the hustle bustle of Hong Kong, which is very hustling, <laughs> a very hustle bustle. But then you can jump on that subway and then get to where you need to be fairly quickly. So. I think it's a nice balance. I remember many times running to the subway because I was late for an appointment down the hill. <laughs> CHK is on a giant hill overlooking the bay, so it's a beautiful view. But uh, yeah, you you definitely need to make time to get down to the subway. But uh, yeah, it, it is a big space, yes, huge space. That's right. You know, you hated yourself again here yeah, because oh, no. uh, same as you. <laughs> oh no, you're scaring me. No, 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 no. You no, no need to be scared. But because you said that KCR. And that's how I also remember the station uh, in this line. But when I came back to Hong Kong seven years ago, I realized KCR and MTR have merged. They are just one entity now. Oh, so wow. now we okay. call all the stations MTR stops. Okay. No more KCR. Oh my gosh. All right. All right. We're recording this in 2023. I'm dating myself. So bad. So bad. Why do you have to point that out? All right. Well, no, thank you for pointing that out. We only have a few more minutes uh, left with you, Professor Wan. So I want to talk about careers. Of course, anyone who's going to go to CUHK uh, MBA is going to be very concerned about that first post MBA job and th their subsequent career. So I noticed two things: your elite mentorship program and your alumni career advisor scheme look very interesting to me. I'm wondering if maybe you could talk more about those as well as any other unique benefits you feel like the business school can really help its students with in terms of their career searches. Yeah, sure. So uh, we haven't really touched on it much, but I want to emphasize it. An, an MBA program like the one we offer here at CUHK, we designed it quite carefully. We've talked a bit about the academic component of it, where you know we have multiple courses in different disciplines and I teach one of them, et cetera. But an equally important part of it is the accompanying, the sort of non-academic component of it. Non-academic in the sense that you know, students don't earn credit for doing them, but it's an essential part of the experience. So we inspire ourselves from this idea of leaping into becoming a leader transforming from a manager leaping into a leadership position. So we have created this uh, accompanying program called the LEAD program. And it actually, you know, a nice play on words. It stands for Leadership Advancement or Leadership Excellence, rather, and Advancement Program, L-E-A-P. And uh, the two schemes you mentioned, the Elite Mentorship Program, the Academic Advisor Scheme, are part of this LEAD series to help our students leap into leadership positions. Right, so it's all part of this vision we have to develop global business leaders for the Asian century. So in addition to uh, uh, career-related advice and uh, guidance, the LEAP series also helps with the uh, development of additional non-academic skills. Okay, so for example, we are doing this uh, conversation right now. I mean, I, I don't know how you feel about it, but to me, Communication is a very important skill that no one ever taught me at school. <laughs> and I just had to learn it you know, over the years and try my best to, you know, to communicate you know, what I want to communicate at this point. So we want our students to also develop these kinds of skills while they are with us. 
Now, we may not get them 100% to where they want to be, but at least we want to have a, a role uh, in, in, in helping them accomplish that. So in terms of career um, uh, contact points, the elite mentorship and the academic, uh, the, sorry, the alumni career advisory uh, scheme both involve our alumni. Okay, so this is a way we try to capitalize on the extensive alumni network we have by virtue of being the oldest MBA program here in the region. And uh, they run in slightly different ways. The elite mentors, we position it as a sort of a skills and life mentorship kind of uh, arrangement. Very senior alumni, some of them, you know, retired or, you know, about to retire, they feel fulfillment in being able to impart you know, their, their, their wisdom to the younger generation of students. The career guidance or career uh, advisory scheme, on the other hand, involves younger alumni, uh, our graduates from more recent years, who are still very active in, uh, in the corporate world. And here we, uh, we provide their expertise to our current students more directly related to job search and developing career interests understanding what an industry is about. And again, it's not just in Hong Kong, because you know, even if we have uh, been a primarily Hong Kong based program, we actually have a very diversified global alumni base. From the last statistics I saw, I think our alumni are in more than 40 countries around the world. Uh, so, you know, in terms of uh, developing uh, career interest and looking for job prospects, it's not just in Hong Kong, but it's potentially in any of these 40 different countries. Yeah. And I mean, would you mind sharing the top industries your graduates, your MBA graduates are moving into and whether that is changing as Hong Kong and China change? Yeah. So uh, it would not be a surprise to know the biggest industry has been finance. Uh, Hong Kong, after all, is, has been a, an international financial center for many decades now. And uh, that has been the historical trend. Now, uh, things have changed a little bit, I have to say. So when I look at recent classes of our MBA students, many of them are actually already accomplished business people in their own rights, in the sense of they set up their own business or they are helping manage a family business. Now, uh, these are across a broad spectrum of areas of, of different industries. It's not all finance related. Now, finance is still a large, I would say probably between one third to a half of, uh, of uh, you know, what our graduates end up being interested in or wanting to pursue a career in. Uh, but there is also in a, a large uh, fraction that are interested in uh, entrepreneurship uh, and even innovation related pursuits. Uh, entrepreneurship in the broader sense of the word, uh, for example, incorporating running a family business. So yes, it has. Uh, I think it has changed, and I think we we are going to continue to see this kind of uh, of, of shift uh, going into the future. Mm. And what should a CUHK MBA's expectations be in terms of boosting their career with your program? Because it is a shorter program, right? Twelve months. It's accelerated. So, what do they need to know? If they come to the program with this shared vision, as we've mentioned, their own version of it, what, what should their expectations be? Yeah. So I can answer this in, in three different scenarios uh, in terms of you know, a typical student, what they are looking for. If, for example, we are thinking about finance as an industry, there are potentially two main categories of students who are thinking of going into the finance industry. One would be you know, a student who already worked in finance before and they are looking at the MBA degree as a way to advance their career, to help them get that promotion. I think for these students, um, it's relatively more straightforward for them to think about because they already know the industry. They already have experience in that industry and they know what they are getting into and they know how the MBA degree can help them. The other type of student might be someone who's thinking of switching career. They've never worked in finance before. Now they are interested in it and uh, knowing Hong Kong is a major international financial center and doing an MBA here might give them this entry point. Now for these two types of students, I would say they should adjust their expectations accordingly. A student who has never had finance experience and has the aspiration of joining the finance industry, 
Of course, uh, the MBA degree will help them do that. But they should have different expectations compared to someone who's worked in the industry before for, for, for multiple years. Uh, in terms of, for example, entry point, you know, salary, all of these different factors, they have to be, let's quote unquote, call it, uh, you know, be realistic. Right? So don't just look at your classmate telling you he or she got this job offer with these you know, nice features and expect that you should get the same. Right? It all depends on where you came from and what you have to offer. Now, the third category of student, if I may briefly talk about that as well, would be this, uh, you know, not necessarily finance related, but people who already are running their own business or are thinking of picking up you know, a management or leadership role in a family business. Now, for them, it's also quite different because they already know roughly what they are going to get into post MBA, but it's in very different circumstances, right? So a family business might involve siblings. <laughs> so, you know, understanding how these uh, relationships will work out and how an MBA is, you know, providing one sibling, you know, better or different preparation, you know, is something they would have to resolve with their siblings. Somebody who already runs their own business, you know, we have quite a few examples of these types of students already. They may be thinking, okay, their business is quite successful. Uh, they have competent managers in place. So they take a year break from the business, right? Maybe they hold weekly online meetings and they feel that's sufficient to, to, keep, you know, to keep monitoring the business. But they want to use this one year to, um, to acquire some of the fundamental structured knowledge from a business point of view, like accounting, right? Somebody may never have learned anything about accounting. Suddenly they find themselves with a successful business and uh, they need, suddenly need to understand, right? So it's an accelerated way to learn all the key uh, business disciplines in a compressed period of time, in addition to establishing contacts with the network. The network is something also that we should not underestimate. We do yeah. have the largest alumni network and it's a key asset uh, that our students can definitely take advantage of. Mm. I'm, I'm going to try to squeeze these last two questions in. I, I know I'm over time, but one, how important is it to know Cantonese or Mandarin and to, for those non-Mandarin, non-Cantonese speakers thinking, considering your program? That's the first question. Okay. Uh, well, again, I take myself as an example, right? It's not critical. It depends what you want to do, right? So uh, uh, if you want to work in Hong Kong in the finance industry, I would say, again, there are two categories. We have a lot of uh, international financial firms in Hong Kong. If that's the kind of firm you end up working in, English is probably good enough. And right? that's the kind of situation I've been in. We also see the emergence more and more of uh, local or mainland China-based firms coming to establish a presence in Hong Kong, or even potentially offering job opportunities in mainland China to our graduates. Now, if that's the case, then I would say there's, a, there's probably a, a stronger need to brush up or acquire the language. Uh, but it also it depends on you know, what, what our students want for themselves. So as far as language skills for your first question, that's what I would say. You know, it's not a one answer fits everyone kind of sure. situation. It depends uh, what yes. you want to do later on. Professor Wan, this has been really fun. I've really enjoyed this chat. And I just, my last question is, is there anything else about the COHK MBA program that you just wish more candidates knew about? Well, I think I've already mentioned one of the key ones, which is the campus housing. That's not to be neglected. I mean, we're talking about thousands of dollars <laughs> over the course of a year, it all adds up. Uh, but the other thing I would say is the general you know, environment and the sense of culture and the sense of family that we have here in CUHK. It's something I hear from our alumni as well. I never really appreciated it until recently when I kept hearing it. People say, they tell me, you know, in CUHK, there's a special feeling, there's a special vibe. And I think part of it is related to the mission the university as a whole uh, was founded on. This principle of bringing not just East and West, but also tradition and modernity. So there's a very strong cultural uh, aspect of being in the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And it's about the Chinese culture, as you can guess, yeah, from the name of the university. Right. So, so this is something I think is very hard for me to express when I explain it this way. The best way is to experience it. <laughs> so again, I, you know, encouraging listeners to get in touch with us. And if you have a chance to come and visit us on campus here in Hong Kong, try it. 
come see for yourself and get that sense of of, of you know of culture of, uh, of of being part of the family that I'm talking about. You will feel it. Thank you so much, Professor Wan, for your time. Not at all. Thanks to you for inviting me. Thanks for listening to the Touch MBA podcast. Remember, you can get free school selection help and a profile review at touchmba.com. You can also follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Just search for Touch MBA.